Kia ora and welcome to everyone again. And um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Hazel Keedle, uh, who is our next speaker. Hazel is a midwifery lecturer at um, Western Sydney University, Australia. And for the last seven years, Hazel has researched women's experiences of vaginal birth after caesarean uh, section. First for, for women who did this at home and now for women who access a variety of models of care. Hazel is passionate about educating both women and healthcare professionals on the importance of VBAC and Hazel aims to reinforce the importance for all midwives to embrace supporting and encouraging women to have their own VBAC journey. So welcome Hazel and I'll just turn you into a presenter. Hi there, and thank you very much for that introduction. So this presentation today will be um, called the journey. It's called the journey from pain to power, and it looks at a meta ethnography that I did um, on women's experiences of having a VBAC, and I'll go into more detail on what that is in just a second. Um, so yes, I am at the Western at Western Sydney Uni um, as a midwifery lecturer, but also as a PhD candidate. And this meta-ethnography, meta gosh, I can't get my word around it, um, is was the first part of my PhD. So a bit of a background, um, vaginal birth after cesarean, or VBAC as I'll be calling it, is known to be a safe and satisfying option for many women who've had a previous cesarean. Yet the rates of VBAC remain low in the majority of countries. In Australia, for example, in 2015, only 19% of women who birthed that year had a vaginal birth after cesarean. Now, we don't know how many of those chose to have a VBAC and have a repeat emergency cesarean, um, or how many chose to have a cesarean to begin with, but still those statistics um, are very low. And we also know from the research that we need to improve health practitioners' understanding of the factors that facilitate or hinder women in the journey to having a VBAC. So like I said, this is part of my PhD study, um, and the title for my PhD is The Antenatal Experiences of Women Planning a VBAC in Australia. And there are a few parts to it. So the first part was this meta-ethnography, and I'll go into more detail on what that is, and that's been published in Women and Birth. And then I've done a qualitative study, because um, the PhD is a mixed methods study. And so the, the next part was qualitative, um, and that was called the My VBAC App Study. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about that later and even a little bit of an um, insight into some of the results, but that paper is currently being written. What hasn't been done yet is an online survey, and that's the last part of my um, PhD study. And that will be um, a national um, survey across Australia, looking at the themes, asking women about the main themes that have come out of the My VBAC app study. And that'll be for women um, who, in the last five years, have planned to have a VBAC in Australia, Doesn't, don't necessarily have had to have had the VBAC at the end. Because I'm really interested in, the, in those antenatal experiences um, and what drives women to have a VBAC, but also what are the challenges that they have along the way. So just looking at the PhD now, um, I've used a transformative framework with a critical feminist lens. And these are the different phases. The phase one is the metastography, the, the qualitative one is phase two, and phase three is the quantitative. So just showing you that in a diagram. So a metaethnography um, has lots of different phases, and that comes from Noblet and Hare. So the first part is getting started um, and having an idea of what you want to look at, which for me was women's experiences of having a VBAC. You then decide what is relevant to the initial interest. So you do a literature research and um, you, you find the studies that you need to. You then read those studies. You determine how the studies are related to each other. Um, and you express the synthesis. You synthesize the translation. Oh, sorry, I got the way around there. You translate the studies into one another. You synthesize that and then you express the synthesis. So lots of fancy terms there. Um, I do kind of see it as you look for all the qualitative work on that particular 
um, topic. You put it all together, uh, you, you read them all, and then you go through and see what, what are the links and what are the common themes so that you can come out with your own um, overarching theme and theme. So it's a bit like a thematic analysis of work that's already been done. So to find out what was relevant and um, that phase two, um, I've got the PRISMA diagram here. Uh, there wasn't a heap of studies really done on just the qualitative experiences of women um, having a VBAC. So um, by the time I got to the end, I found 20 studies. And after I had looked at them and I had translated the research into each other and done all that, I came up with an overarching um, theme, which was the journey from pain to power. And along that were many other themes. Um, and it starts as we do with a journey. You, you start at A and you get to B. And so the, the starting part of the journey for, um, for the women in these studies was the beginning of their, um, was their previous cesarean. And that was described as the hurt me. So the women really looked into um, the expressing how they felt about their cesarean. Now I'm going to go into each of these in detail, so I'll just quickly give you a quick over, overview. Then they got all the way to the end, um, which is the, my, uh, the oh, sorry, the powerful me, which is the VBAC, and then the onward journey, which is the effects of having the VBAC. In the middle here, we have armed of knowledge, seeds of doubt, and feeling encouraged and supported, and they were the journey. And this is the big themes that the women came up um, came up against in their journey. So looking at the hurt me, the hurt me really describes the experience women had having a cesarean and how they felt after they had the cesarean. So we have a couple of our extra um, sub themes here. One was caught between life and death and failing as a woman. So the caught between life and death was where women really described the impact of having the cesarean, having an emergency cesarean, being told that, you know, we have to go for a cesarean right now or your baby will die. And sometimes then that actually really being the fact. Um, the, 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 they described how it was being taken into theatre, uh, maybe having brand new strangers around you, and, and really the fear that um, having that caesarean experience um, caused them. The failing as a woman was, was, as you can see here with this quote, was looking at how they felt about their body. And I felt a total sense of failure. I felt my body had let me down. It wasn't the birth I imagined, and I just couldn't get over that. So, you know, really thinking, well, that, you know, the, this ideal that I had, this birth that I really wanted, it just didn't happen. And maybe that was my fault. That Maybe that was because of my body. So then, you know, the, the women start their VBAC journey. Um, and the women in these studies, they didn't just take information at face value. They actually looked up their information. Now with um, the internet, obviously the women can access um, academic journals like like academics can and professionals can and they often would and they would become they would find that getting this information would arm them with knowledge so you can see with this statistic here you know there might be one in a hundred chances that I have you turn rupture but they kept focusing on the fact that I might be that as in be that one might be that one person that has it me I was thinking look I'm most likely going to be one of the 99 so this woman actually had read studies and had got the statistics of what it would be for her to have a uterine rupture and was able to reconcile that. Um, and the two sub things that come under here is reconciling the risk, as can be shown in, in that quote, but also seeking birth care options. So early on, um, and sometimes not, not very early on, sometimes well into their pregnancy, they would realise that who they went to see um, as their healthcare provider would have an impact um, on their ability to have a feedback. And so those options were often, often sought. That might even be um, birthing at home. And with the studies that I had out of the 20, there was um, one study that based um, in, I think it was Scotland, that, that was birth centre births, and one that was um, home births. So women that had, had a home birth. So they were across the different um, birth care options, which was a little bit different being able to bring in those, that, um, those different birth care options. So the women really did seek, and certainly the women that um, chose the birth centre or chose the home birth, you know, they really did look up their um, information and they were knowledgeable about why they were making those decisions. 
Now, the seeds of doubt is the next um, next theme. And this is really the negative part of their journey, and it really encompasses all the negative issues that happened. The negative attitudes were what the women experienced um, from their healthcare providers. And you can see here, when I was pregnant with Jo, I was told by a doctor that I was most likely going to die and that my son, Jack, wouldn't have a mother to go home to and to embark on a very backward stupidity. So I knew that was ridiculous, but it still affects you. And those negative attitudes, um, I'd like to say that, you know, these are because these studies are a little bit older, but unfortunately they're not. And even on the qualitative work we're doing right now, um, you know, these, these attitudes are out there. Um, and, and even when a woman can try and brush it off, like she did here, she, she showed me that was ridiculous. But, you know, it's just there and it's there to act as a, as a seed to make you doubt your actual decision. The fighting for a better birth. Um, that was when women, you know, they, they knew what they wanted. They knew that they wanted to have a VBAC and they had a real fight on their hands. And that fight is seen as a negative because it's, it's an added stress to have to continuously say this is what you want and why you want it when you have healthcare professionals around you saying, well, that's just not safe, you shouldn't do that, you know, is a negative aspect of their, um, of their pregnancy journey. I do apologise, my son is in the background. I told him to be quiet, but he's not been very good at it. Okay, um, then on to another positive aspect of the journey um, was feeling encouraged and supported. And um, yeah, there, there were some great positive healthcare practitioners that were um, reflected in the research. Um, and not just from there, but also the social support from strong women was really important. So the women might access um, online groups uh, that are specific for VBAC. Uh, in Australia, we have a very large one that's got over 5,000 members now, and there would be in other um, countries as well, and, in, and international groups as well. And they were there for when the women really started having those doubts in the, in the previous slide. They were able to go onto their online forums and say, this is what I've just been told. And then they would have instant um, um, support from the women on the group and that was the benefit of of the online community there and the same as if the women were having doubts themselves they would then get that instant encouragement support from family and friends was really important but there was a little bit of selective telling with this um, so the women would really gauge who they could um, and who they wouldn't share their plans for VBAC for um, some would have a very supportive family members such as a grandma um, or a mother-in-law or some and others would know who not to really tell because they don't want those negative influences. The women did speak about having a supportive partner um, and how important that was and especially what hasn't really been looked at much in research and only touched on in these is the importance of the VBAC for the partner because if they are the same partner from before and they had seen the traumatic experience that happened before, how validating a VBAC um, in their partner can be for them as well. But more work needs to be done in that area. So you can see here, um, the quote is, I was feeling more confident too. I was getting a lot of positive feedback and support from friends and family. And that's really important. So then once they had got their V back, um, they, they really felt powerful. Um, and this was a lovely thing because it's all about the positive aspects of having a V back. Um, the three sub-themes here are achieving VBAC against the odd, odds, I felt like superwoman, and reclaiming my, my womanhood. So achieving VBAC against the odds is where the women reflected on the fact that they achieved it. You know, even with all the negative experiences that they had, all the naysayers throughout their pregnancy, um, the fighting against um, not wanting to have interventions and going down the same path, um, they still managed to achieve their VBAC. Um, and there were some beautiful quotes in there. The I felt like superwoman was was really women in that initial um, phase. I don't even know if it would be initial, but when they reflect back. Um, I know in the home birth after cesarean study that I did that was included in this, um, I had the joy of being able to ask women um, in their postnatal interviews, how did you feel after your VBAC at home? And this is where exactly where the quote came from. I felt like superwoman. Um, and just that elation.
situation that the woman was able to to birth in the way that she wanted to and that beautiful quote there i believe my scar is now mentally healed it just really you know i, I agree that is a brilliant quote and it really does sum up the link between you know the the physical aspects of birthing um, but the emotional and um, psychological um, aspects of birthing as well the reclaiming my womanhood was when women reflected back um, on the importance of of having a vaginal birth which to the majority of women who are planning a feedback they may have not had um, a vaginal birth before you know cesarean may have been their first birth and this is their second and subsequent and they don't know what they don't know they don't know what it's going to feel like to have a vaginal birth they don't know if they're actually going for the you know for the right option um, and the reclaim of my womanhood was really where women look back and go well yeah I'm, I'm i'm really glad that i did that and it really was important to to have a vaginal birth for me now what i haven't one of the ones that i've um, skipped through in there is with the seeds of doubt um is also the and the fighting for a better birth it's the fighting that women had about not wanting to have the repeat interventions that they had before you know women were coming to this journey already knowing that the interventions didn't work for them you know they may have been um a particular they may have had you know the the standard primate who goes post AIDS, who gets induced and gets every single intervention under the sun and has a repeat cesarean and they're already able to articulate well i don't want to be induced and i don't want to have that ctg i don't want to have um the iv fluids that, that keep me to the bed but when women then approach the healthcare providers during their pregnancy about that they would get shouted down and said well that's in policy that's what you have to do um, and when you look at the VBAC policies, that's certainly what is in there for their own reasons. And that was quite um, a challenge for women. Well, they're, they're, they know what they need to do to have a normal birth and to have um, an active labour, but then they're being given these restrictions because of policy to make it even harder to achieve, to achieve their VBAC. And they didn't stop there. So once they had their VBAC and they felt like superwoman, there was this confidence um, that affected other areas of their life. Immediately it affected their role as a mother. And as you can see here, my onward, uh, uh, my onward journey after birthing Jack, who was my second birth at home, I was confident as a mother. I was never confident as a mother with faith. So her first one had been a planned birth um, at home and um, emergency cesarean. And then this time she did have her VBAC at home. And that confidence also would then impact breastfeeding um, and impact the way that they were, were um, feeling in their postnatal period. But it didn't always, sorry, one more bit, I'll just go back to that one again. It didn't just stop there either. So not just becoming a confident mother, but often these women would go on and become birth advocates um, for other women who are going through their journey, especially their VBAC journey. So many would stay on their on the VBAC forums online so they could give confidence to other women that are going through the journey. They may even go into formal doula training. Um, and that certainly was something that came out of the HBAC study. But in the papers that I looked at, there was one paper in particular that looked at women who um, planned a VBAC but didn't achieve a VBAC and had a repeat cesarean. And in a couple of the papers, there were um, a few women that had been um, that had had a repeat cesarean when they'd been um, recruited during pre during their pregnancy. And this is an area that really needs some more um, research, really, because we've only got very small numbers on this. But what I found from looking at the, the paper and the few others uh, mentions of it in their papers was that women often felt like a failure again. Um, and this really does link in with the um, not being able to negotiate, um, not having interventions. As you can see here, I was taking the time of a first labor, first birth, but I had the time constraints of a second birth and a VBAC. Thankfully, we do know now that um, certainly in the new ACOG guidelines, there is criticism of giving such um, small time constraints on women planning a VBAC um, and that these these should be lifted and thought more of, more likely to be like women who have in their first labour and birth. 
because we really do um, set women up to fail, um, and that's one of the sub themes there. Uh, you know, we we will um, enforce these policies and these time restraints for women that have never, may have never even laboured before, um, and then having um, having the issues there. Gaining resolution was that some women actually had a repeat emergency cesarean for the same reasons that they had before, and that actually gave them some resolution. Um, that maybe this was just going to happen anyway. But they didn't regret being having the option of going for a VBAC um, because it meant that they could have a second chance. So this has been published um, in Women and Birth. And so if you want to read some more information, um, that would be, that, that's where you would go for that. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what else I have been doing. So the next phase was um, the MyVBAC app study. Um, so what I wanted to, to capture next uh, was for, for my qualitative phase, I wanted to get that moment when the woman has gone to see her midwife or her doctor, she's had the appointment, she's come home and she's having the what if moment. You know when you've gone to see your GP or your doctor, you've got this whole big speech in your head, you go in there and you completely forget absolutely everything you were going to say and you come out and you go, oh God, why didn't I say this or why didn't I do that? And sometimes those appointments were positive and sometimes they were negative. But I really wanted to find out what were women thinking when they come home from their appointments. So not so much what we told women, but what did they perceive that they were told? And I didn't really know how to do that. I couldn't go interviewing women after every single appointment. So I came up with this idea of an app that women would have on their smartphones so that after every appointment, they could go home and they could record either an audio and a video log on their smartphones and it would be sent straight to me as the researcher. I did that. I've had 11 women on the study and in total, I got 53 logs. So that's 53 times after appointments that women did um, shared with me their experiences. Uh, and it was, I'm, I'm just in the writing up of the paper of this and it was just amazing. It was a little bit addictive for me. I would be checking my side of the researcher side of the app all the time to see if somebody had put a new segment in, a bit like a, a soap opera. Um, and it had its challenges as well. Sometimes I would hear something that was, that I would want to step in and go, my God, why were you told that? Um, as a practicing midwife myself, but I had to have the researcher's stance um, and not be involved. Although if there was something particularly serious, I would send an email just to check in to see if they were okay. Um, so that that was done, and I think it was, you know, the data we've got is so rich, which is why it's making writing it into one paper particularly hard. Um, but I'm certainly trying. Um, so, but the actual development of the app is also going to be available for researchers soon to be able to use for their own types of studies. And I already have two researchers, um, I believe in Canada, who are interested in using the app. That's just being um, developed further now. And um, so I wrote a paper on how to do the app. Um, not particularly the ins and outs of the app development because I'm not an app developer. I did have to recruit somebody to do that for me. Um, but I did learn a whole lot about app development and learning a second language, really. So I wrote a paper on the design, the development, and the evaluation of a qualitative data collection app for pregnant women, and that's in the Journal of Nursing Scholarship. So feel free to have a look in there, and it's got some pretty pictures about the, about the app there. Um, and so from the, um, the My View Back app study, I had, like I said, I had 11 women. They were a mix of care providers and birth locations. So as you can see here, um, there was private obstetricians. PPM is privately practicing midwife. So this is based in Australia. Um, so privately practicing midwife would be um, outside of the hospital system and the woman would have to pay for that, although there are Medicare rebates. So the women can get some money back from appointments. Um, and they may be offering support um, midwifery services in the hospital if they have visiting rights, which is growing in Australia, or planning to birth at home. MGP is midwifery group practice, um, which is hospital, hospital provided and based. GP stroke obst is a GP obstetrician where they would do shared care with their GP, who's also an obstetrician um, certified in the community. And the clinic is fragmented care, so coming along to the hospital clinic and seeing whoever's there, that might be doctors or midwives.
Um, you can see from there that six had a VBAC and five had an emergency cesarean. So I've got some more data now on um, the experiences of women that have had a repeat cesarean when they planned a VBAC. So that adds to that knowledge, which is really useful. Um, and um, just giving you a quick snip into, please don't take a photo of this page because um, I haven't published it yet, but a little snippet into what the um, findings have been is that we found four factors to having a VBAC or feeling resolved. So um, if you imagine these has been a bit of a Likert scale and the higher the woman was up on one of these, so each one of these, the higher she was up on that scale, the more likely she was to have a VBAC or feel resolved after having a repeat cesarean. The lower she was on these scales, the less likely she, the, she was to have a VBAC, more likely to have a repeat cesarean or feeling disappointed, although that probably should go together because none of the women who had a VBAC felt disappointed. And these four are feeling in control, so the woman feeling in control of um, the labour and the birth and even just the pregnancy and her decision-making skills. The confidence, this is the confidence of the woman in her own ability to have a VBAC, but also the confidence in the, the, that she felt the healthcare provider had in her ability to have a VBAC, and that's a very important point. Relationship-based care is like contingency, contingency of care, um, but actually contingency of care that has a relationship or partnership model to it. Um, so there were some that had private obstetrician and had that, contingency of care, but there wasn't a deep relationship there. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the paper. And then again, then active labour. So the more of an active labour um, that the woman had, the more likely she was to have a VBAC, and we know that. Um, and the more restricted um, or the more intervention she had, the less likely she was to have the VBAC. But it was an important factor um, within the four. So a little bit of a snippet there for you, and a little bit of a, an insight, and there will be a paper on that soon. And so the last stage will be doing an online survey, which I hope to get out um, later on this year. And we will, I'll be asking questions around those four factors and so really see if we can um, prove that on a, on a quantitative um, scale. And that's me. Great presentation, Hazel. Um, everybody was uh, very... Uh, very um, oh, concentrating, I'd say, really carefully on what you were saying. Just a few questions. There was one from um, Cheryl about what was the incidence of VBAC after IV, IVF. So, so yeah. there wasn't in the papers in the twenty papers I looked at, there wasn't any um, identification that women had had um, IVF. Um, in my recent study um, uh, on the VBAC app, I've had one woman who um, had IVF and then went on the VBAC journey. Um, so yeah, we don't really have very much information on that particularly. I think that would be a really interesting paper on its own. Indeed, indeed it would. Um, and uh, there was a question from Celine, I think, uh, were there any guidelines for midwives in Australia and New Zealand other than the medical um, guidelines? Not specifically. Um, I guess we, we do kind of get governed by the medical guidelines because they then um, form our policies, which we then follow. Um, certainly in Australia, we have the National um, Free um, Consultation and Referral Guidelines, and they don't specify much on VBAC unless it was um, a, a, a classical scar, for example, then that would be um, a referral to tertiary services. Uh, but otherwise, it's not really, um, VBAC isn't really mentioned. Um, and, but yeah, there's not a lot of guidance really just for, just for midwifery care. So, although the, the ACOG guidelines, the American um, College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have put out some new VBAC guidelines, and I do encourage um, the viewers to go and look, look at them. They came out in October, November last year, and they are quite progressive, actually, um, to support midwifery and obstetricians. So they support women who are having a VBAC after two cesareans. Um, they... Um, you know, they, they recognise that um, women shouldn't be coerced into their decisions. So they're, they're quite um, interesting reading, actually, and hopefully um, that will have an impact on um, practitioners and guidelines. 
I can just see, sorry, can I just um, answer Penny there who says regional access to VBAC is a huge hurdle. I completely um, agree. It's really difficult. I did have one woman in the VBAC app study, actually a couple of women in regional locations, and what they were told to do um, to be able to access a, a VBAC was crazy exactly that she would need to travel um, in, in this particular scenario she was told um, that they would have to get an obstetrician from from at least an hour away to come because their obstetricians aren't happy to do that it is really really um, difficult to uh, to access in regional locations and regional rural locations in Australia Is there any more? What about, any, any more what, about, what about forbidding out of hospital VBAC? So, Celine, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, by, by us saying that they shouldn't do that or the fact that it is um, forbidden. Um, in Australia, women can access um, out of hospital VBAC through a privately practicing midwife if that privately practicing midwife is um, confident and happy to do that. Um, Although we know that with out of hospital VBAC, you do have higher chances of having a VBAC, usually over um, an 80% um, rates of having v of, of being able to have a VBAC compared to about 60 to, in hospitals. Um, there are um, there are higher rates of um, neonatal um, morbidity and mortality, and and. You know, when you look at the studies, it, it, it's not it's not massive, um, but it is there. So women just need to be informed on that. Um, it doesn't mean that an out of hospital VBAC is going to cause a dead baby, although many many women have been told that. Um, but they you know they just need to be aware that it's a slightly higher risk, and to think about their access to the hospital. Um, it, like all out of hospital births, if there is a good referral um, pathway and good relationships between the healthcare providers and the hospitals. That certainly goes in a long way. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by informed choice of, for place of birth. Uh, what have you got there? Have, have you looked, looked at, at you looked at our provider, our insurance, provider insurance, 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 insurance insurance? I haven't. So I was particularly looking at, or the papers I was doing for this for this methodology was looking at women's experiences, um, and also in my PhD um, work, I'm looking at women's experiences. Um, there have been some papers that have looked at um, healthcare practitioners' experiences and confidence. Um, we do know, though, that insurance has had a major impact, certainly in the USA, um, and that is somewhat um, addressed or mentioned in the new ACOG guidelines that it shouldn't obviously be an issue, but um, and that more places should be offering um, VBAC. But yeah, you know, I can I can see that would be a real issue, and there and in that way, women are you know are either being made to make the decision because their healthcare provider won't you know won't support that or the hospital won't support that and there are some shocking stories that come out about this um or they go searching for somebody that will or they go without care and um and they look at the free birth option although there's a very small amount of women that do that um but the more that we make it difficult for women to access the birth they want the the, the more that will happen Thank you. Are there any more questions for um, Hazel? Sounds like you've done really well, Lee Hazel. All right, thank you.